Cool. Fine. All right. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this uh, Punk Pesca's webinar, uh, webinar. And hello, Daniel. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for your presence. Uh, so, just a quick intro. Uh, my name is Nick, uh, and my colleague Anna is online as well. Uh, we both work at CIENA, a Portuguese NGO, and we are promoting this series of webinars uh, under Punk Pesca's work, which is the Portuguese platform uh, of NGOs that work on fisheries related subjects subjects here in Portugal uh, and well given the circumstances we decided to host this uh, series of webinars to to give a little info on a lot of people that that have been working in fisheries related subjects and are uh, aware of the next EMFF so this is our third session if I'm not mistaken and the first one in English given fourth, our fourth, fourth session fourth, Sorry. fourth session yeah uh, First one in English, thanks to our, thanks to our speaker today, uh, who is uh, Daniel Skerritt. So uh, Daniel works at the University of British, British Columbia uh, in the Fisheries Economic Research Unit. So thank you very, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Daniel. We're going to have um, a presentation by Daniel, which should go around 20 minutes more or less. Um, and then a Q&A. So what we'll ask all the... All the uh, all the people who are attending is for you to please uh, write down your questions or commentaries as the presentation goes. So you can leave it on the uh, Q&A box, which you will find on the bottom of your screen. And Anna and me will collect the questions and then ask them to Daniel at the end. So we'll have around um, 30 minutes more or less for questions after the talk. Um, and we can, we can, ex uh, maybe move it a little bit if needed, um, according to Daniel's uh, talk. Um, it will uh, work in, as in um, first come, first served regarding the questions. So feel free to uh, uh, submit your questions um, as soon as you have them, okay? Uh, the session will be recorded um, and made available online. And if it's okay well, then with Daniel, we'll share his presentation as well. Yep, um, yeah, of course. Okay, so perfect. I'll give the... I'll give you the word, Daniel. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, just to let you know that, that we have already 30 people online. I, I am not sure if the participants can see uh, how many people we have online, but we have 30 so far. Okay. okay great. Hopefully you can all see that um, kind of title page yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I'll just get rid of this. Awesome. Well, I'll start. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nick and Anna, for that introduction, and again for inviting me to present. Uh, I think it's great that kind of you you moved so quickly to get your conference online. You know, I think this is going to be a more and more regular event for us guys to kind of for us all to present and interact like this. So it's really great. Uh, I'm going to present a kind of the academics viewpoint of fisheries subsidies. Uh, so it might be a bit different to, I know you had recently a webinar from um, a member of DG Mari, the European Commission, so it might be slightly different to that. Um, but I'll talk about fishery subsidies and their kind of implications for fish, fishery sustainability. And before I start, this is probably quite odd for you guys, but I'm based here in Vancouver. Uh, so it's quite important for me to quickly acknowledge um, that where I'm presenting from in Vancouver is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Watuf nations. Um, cool. So I'd say I'll, I'll give a quick background on kind of overfishing and the role that fishery subsidies can play in exacerbating that. Uh, that'll be quite quick, only about five minutes. And then I'll move into the kind of giving you guys an update of our fishery subsidies work. So we've estimated global fishery subsidies also down to the regional level. And then from that, we'll move into a couple of slides about um, the European Union in particular, their level of subsidization and how that has changed over the last kind of 20 years or so. Um, I'll then address at the end, the need to eliminate harmful su fishery subsidies, at least again, from, from our perspective. And um, quickly discuss the ongoing World Trade Organization negotiations to try and end harmful fishery subsidies, and which is linked to the goals of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, as I say, I won't spend too much time on this, but it's quite important that we kind of set the scene of, of, of the context in which fishery subsidies are, are 
provided. So this graph here shows um, reconstructed and reported from the FAO figures, global catch of seafood since 1950. So you can see there's been a steady increase, increase from 1950s. We've kind of peaked at around the mid 1990s. And since then we've seen either a leveling off or possibly a slight reduction in the amount of seafood that we catch from the world's oceans. Uh, this is a similar story is playing across all of the world's ocean and seas. Uh, this example here from the Sea Around Us website is from the North Sea. And again, you can see this kind of steady increase, a kind of leveling off and peaking around the mid 1990s. And since then, a decrease in the amount of uh, catch taken from the North Sea. So the amount of catch has kind of plateaued or at least in some cases reduced since the 1990s. Uh, but this, is, this graph here is looking actually at the abundance of fish in the waters rather than the catch that's taken from those stocks. So this is looking at commercial fish stocks in the uh, North Atlantic. And um, this shows the kind of relative abundance in, in those regions. You can see really high levels of productivity along the kind of uh, banks of Eastern Canada and the, and the US and all the way down the coast of Europe, all the way down to Africa, those really high areas of productivity in the 1900s. If we fast forward 100 years, you'll see that the scene is quite different today. Biomass on average is reduced by about tenfold. Again, this is commercial fish stocks, important to remember that. Um, and so we're seeing this again across many of the world's oceans. So despite these massive reductions in fish biomass over the last hundred years, we're still seeing, as this graph shows here, this is reported global fish catches. We're still seeing kind of steady, at least fluctuating catches around that mid 1990s global peak. So it's, 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 it's odd that we're kind of able to keep these catches really high while fish abundance is decreasing. So this can be explained when we start, when we map the relative effort that we're exerting in order to catch those fish the amount of effort we have to put in to keep that catch high, to keep it level from the 1990 peak has increased massively over the last kind of 20, 25 years. So in order to maintain that catch, we're having to put in more effort. Effort has kind of effectively has increased in three dimensions. First through geographic expansion. So over time, industrialized fishing has spread across the oceans. Um, also individual fishing vessels are now able to go fishing Further, uh, we have, you know, the advent of distant water fleets. So that's fleets that may be flagged in one nation, but might fish in a totally different region to kind of take advantage of higher abundance of fish in that area. The second expansion is through what we call bathymetric exp expansion. And that's um, the technological advances have essentially allowed us to fish for deeper or harder to reach fish. Um, so we're able to move offshore into deeper waters. And then the third expansion is what we call taxonomic expansion. So essentially over the last 20, 30 years, we've started targeting uh, previously less desirable fish species. Um, so these kind of three ways of expanding our effort has meant that we're able to keep this high global catch rate despite um, dwindling resources. Uh, this is just a quick graph from some data in West Africa that just really highlights that quite easily. Uh, you can see fish biomass in blue decreasing and then catch relative, staying relatively stable since the 1970s peak. But since then, fishing intensity has had to increase in order to keep that, um, keep that catch coming in. So obviously this is not sustainable in terms of the kind of ecology of those fish stocks or, or the environment and neither really in terms of the economics of the fishery. You know, you're having to put more effort in or more costs really in order to get the same kind of return on, on, on that effort. And this is sometimes where fishery subsidies can come in. So, you know, you, you'll all be quite aware of the need to end overfishing. The EU have um, actually put it into law that they will end or should have ended overfishing by the end of this year, I think. Um, and here's just a quick list of like some of the kind of things that we can do to try and help this. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's just kind of illustration of some of the things we can do, such as improve national fisheries management, 
there was a recent study by Ray Hilborn that kind of showed that if we have really good levels of scientific management of fisheries, you know, we can rebuild those stocks and manage them sustainably. Uh, we can support regional cooperation. Uh, many fish stocks are kind of transboundary, so what one nation does can affect the fish uh, abundance in another nation's waters. We can make illegal, unregulated and un unreported fishing unprofitable, so we have a better understanding of the kind of catch that is actually taken and making sure it's all legal. Uh, we can safeguard important areas and species. This is you know, most notably done through marine protected areas, kind of closing off areas of the sea so that they can recover and uh, hopefully re rebuild fish uh, stock levels. And then the last bullet point, which obviously we're gonna focus on today is the removal of harmful fishery substances. And this again is, um, you know, not many people will argue with the need to remove harmful fishery subsidies. Um, there's often a lot of debate about what they might be or how best to do it. But um, the UN have kind of brought in through their sustainable development goals, a target, target 14.6, to actually remove this. And uh, all EU member states are signatories to this as long as, as well as most of the nations across the world. So their target is to, by 2020, prohibit certain forms of fishery subsidies that contribute to overcapacity, overfishing, IUU fishing as well. Um, the kind of deadline for this has, has slipped slightly. It was missed initially uh, in December 2019. Uh, it got moved back to June 2020 of this year. And again, that's kind of been uh, pushed back due to the kind of you know ongoing pandemic that we're all um, suffering. So what is a fishery subsidy? So as I said, as I've briefly highlighted a minute ago, there's quite a lot of debate about exactly what is a subsidy, particularly in fisheries anyway, that uh, has harm. So from our perspective, and there are varying definitions of this, but from our perspective, um, a fishery subsidy is any financial contribution, whether direct or ind indirect, by a public entity, so usually government, to the private fishing sector. This um, financial contribution confers some kind of benefit in some way to the private industry. When uh, harm can be introduced by those fishery subsidies, when they artificially increase the profits or reduce the costs of that private enterprise. So that's a really important kind of aspect of our, our understanding of fishery subsidies. So that's when harm comes in and this can result in overcapacity, i.e. too many boats for not enough fish, and can also lead to overfishing. So I should be able to explain this relatively straightforward using this uh, classic Gordon Schaefer kind of bioeconomic model of fisheries. Um, I'll explain each bit of this and hopefully demonstrate how these harmful fisheries subsidies kind of work. Um, so this graph it, uh, shows the revenue of fishing and the cost of fishing in the y-axis. Uh, against fishing effort along the x-axis. Uh, we assume a constant, so this here is kind of the, the, the cost curve. So if effort increases here, you can see as fishing effort increases, the revenue received and the cost of fishing also increases at the same rate. Uh, the revenue curve is, is, is the kind of, the classic almost bell-shaped curve that, that follows there. The highest point of revenue, which many of you will have probably heard of, is what we call MSY. So this is the, the highest point of the graph. That's where we get the most amount of fish or revenue from a fish stock. The maximum profit that can be received, which is the revenue minus the cost, is a point that we also call, that we call MEY, the maximum economic yield. This is normally a little bit further back from MSY, and you can see it's where the difference between this cost of fishing and the revenue of fishing is the greatest. Uh, but the point that's of most interest to us today is this point called the bioeconomic equilibrium, and that's E3 on the graph there. This is the point where revenues and costs become equal, and is kind of a natural point that fisheries um, tend to fall towards, whether that's because they kind of overfish stock and they stocks and they fall back to that point at where where revenues and costs are equal, or that's kind of where, they're, um, where they fall towards if they're unchecked by management. So if we can understand the kind of main points on this graph, E1, E2, and E3, then it's quite easy to show how harmful fishery subsidies, those that reduce costs, 
and uh, or increase profits artificially, how they kind of come into play. So if we introduce a cost reducing subsidy here, you can see that the cost curve shifts from TC1 to down to TC2. So we've reduced the costs of, the, of those fishing enterprises. As a result of that, the bioeconomic equilibrium moves from E3 to E4. So what we've done now is we've actually means that the, fisher, the, the fleet can exert a higher amount of effort, but the revenue received is actually a lot smaller. So what we've done is we've moved that kind of natural point that fisheries fall towards if they're unchecked by the introduction of these cost reducing subsidies. And so typically these kind of supports can allow fisheries to uh, continue, um, you know, whereas when otherwise they wouldn't have been able to do that, whether due to the economics of the fishery, i.e. their costs are greater than their revenue, or due to the viability of the returning catch due to stock size reducing. So hopefully that kind of explains it a bit. I, I grant you it's probably not that straightforward. So that's um, harmful fishery subsidies, which we sometimes call capacity enhancing subsidies because they can increase the fishing capacity of individual vessels or of the fishing fleet as a whole. But at UBC, we actually catalog subsidies in three by three types. So we have capacity enhancing subsidies such as uh, vessel construction, port construction, fuel subsidies, tax exemptions, things that lower the costs or increase the profits. We have beneficial subsidies which can be things like investments in uh, fisheries management, uh, MPAs, uh, monitoring control, surveillance. You know, they're a subsidy that can infer a benefit to the, to the, fit, to the fishing fleet. And then we have ambiguous subsidies. Uh, these are kind of the gray area between the two. So perhaps that might mean that it's not clear whether they infer a benefit or, a, or, a, or harm, or it's because the precise way that they're kind of uh, provided might result in a different effect or the fleet that receives them, it might result in a different effect. So we kind of lump those together as the ambiguous subsidies. So this um, kind of cataloging system was developed in really early 2000s, perhaps late 90s actually, before my time at UBC. And kind of using that um, over the last 20 years, we've been periodically developing a database of global fishery subsidies. So we go around looking for information on subsidies. We fill this uh, huge database using this cataloging system. And then we developed an approach to kind of fill gaps where we didn't have information, but we, um, we might have had evidence that kind of subsidies existed, but weren't, weren't sure on the price, on the cost of those subsidies. So uh, we recently finished our 2018 update of, of this database, which has been published and is available online. So I'll share briefly the results of that now. Um, so overall, the big kind of figure that everybody looks at is that global fishery subsidies in 2018 was estimated to be about 35 billion US dollars. Uh, this is about in line with what we estimated in 2009, um, which, which isn't ideal because there's been efforts since then to try and reduce that. So it's, it's not been reduced in any way. Uh, this graph here, you can see the kind of the uh, the large circle on the right hand side shows those harmful fishery subsidies and the relative size of it. And about 60% of all fishery subsidies are in the form of harmful fishery subsidies. Uh, this graph also shows kind of the UN split of high development index um, countries and low development index countries. And you can see in, in dark green, the majority, almost 90%, of all subsidies are provided by high HDI countries. Uh, we can also split this down and look at the regional level. Uh, this is kind of geographic region. So Europe there actually includes um, Russia and, and non-EU countries. And you can see this is the absolute amount of subsidies provided. Uh, Asia has the largest fishing fleet as well, but that uh, provides almost $20 billion of US uh, of subsidies every year. And you see Europe's in kind of second place there. But as, as I mentioned, Asia has a huge fishing fleet. So what I normally like to do, rather than just presenting the absolute amount provided, is kind of um, standardize that based on the size of the fishing fleet in those regions. So to give it some context to which these subsidies are being provided. So here I divided that initial graph by the landed value from their fleet. And you can see it kind of changes the picture, Oceania, 
which has relatively low uh, landed value compared to these other regions, kind of shoots to the front. Asia is in second place. But again, let's remember that the, um, the kind of driver in the negotiations for the WTO and for the UN Sustainable Development Goals is to remove capacity enhancing subsidies. So the top of that bar, those bars in red. And when we look at that again, we can see that Asia, Europe, Africa, all providing quite high levels of um, harmful fishery subsidies. And another paper that we've got, uh, which hopefully should come out sometime this year, it's in review at the moment, uh, looks at also the particular fleets that these um, subsidies were provided to. So this here quickly shows um, for those uh, six, seven regions, whether it was provided to a small scale fishing fleet uh, with quite a broad definition of that in dark blue, and then the large scale or industrialized fishing fleet in light blue. And again, so here we can see for all regions really, the majority of those subsidies are provided to the large scale industrial fishing fleet rather than the kind of small scale or inshore fishing fleets across, across the world. We also break down those kind of three categories of harmful, ambiguous and beneficial subsidies into kind of smaller, uh, more specific subsidy types. I won't spend too much time on this, but you can kind of see that um, if we look at the bottom, the majority of uh, fishery subsidies, about 22% of the global total, is provided in one of the most harmful forms, which is fuel subsidy support. So essentially reducing the cost of fuel for all these uh, fishing vessels. Uh, just above that, you can see is a beneficial type, which is great, which is fisheries management. So spending money trying to make sure that fish stocks are, are um, harvested sustainably. But again, we can see that looking at these kind of this breakdown of fishery subsidy type, the majority again provided by high HDI countries. That's both in terms of the beneficial and the and the harmful fishery subsidies. Uh, so quite a lot of information to throw you then, but to provide a kind of high level summary at the global uh, level. Essentially, fisheries, subsidi fisheries subsidies are normally uh, harmful types being provided by high HDI countries and being provided to their large scale and industrial fishing fleets. That's a very broad kind of conclusion at the global scale. So from that database, what I've done here is I've just pulled out the data for EU member states uh, for 2018. And you can see uh, in 2018, the majority of their subsidies for EU member states were actually in the form of beneficial subsidies, 51%. So just over uh, halfway, um, sorry, just laughing at 51%, that kind of, the majority, but only just, right? Um, so you can see, uh, but the second, the second most important subsidy is still capacity enhancing subsidies, uh, providing 42% of, of, of all their subsidies in, in those harmful forms. Uh, that works out to about, um, just a breakdown of those kind of subsidy types within that, it's about 800 million US dollars, we present all our global figures at US dollars, are being spent on fuel subsidies, um, the huge, the big increase in beneficial subsidies was actually uh, based on uh, lots of efforts and lots of uh, money being spent on maintaining and creating marine protected areas across uh, the EU, which is great news. Um, so what we then did was we kind of looked back at, so I said our global database has, um, we've been doing it, I think, four times over the last 20 years, because it's a lot of work. So what we did was we pulled all that information from all our different year databases. And we also then looked at the um, evidence from the EU of the money they spend through the FIFG in 1994 and 2000, 2003, sorry, uh, the EFF in 2007, and then the EMFF in 2014. So this kind of graph here shows um, an estimation of the kind of the, the um, contribution of those three subsidies types, beneficial, ambiguous, capacity enhancing subsidies, over that, that 20 odd year period using those different kind of data sources. So this is quite good news. It shows clearly that the, in white, the capacity enhancing, the harmful subsidies have slowly reduced over time, the, the proportion of, of subsidies provided that are harmful. 
and we see a huge increase in beneficial subsidies over the last kind of 10 years um, across throughout EU member states. Um, this kind of makes sense if, if, if you uh, are aware of the kind of the different um, changes that have happened through FIFGs, the EFF and the EMFF. You know, there's been a huge um, move towards focusing on environmental considerations. So this kind of makes sense. Um, two ways that two key things that they've done is really they've removed some of the most harmful subsidies, such as uh, fleet construction grants, uh, and they've introduced some uh, new. So, so they've kind of removed harmful fishery subsidies and they've also redirected some of those funds to more um, beneficial subsidy types. Um, so this paper is also in review and will hopefully be coming out in the coming months. It's just doing its kind of last round of um, revisions. And so this also, this paper kind of then looks at what this means in terms of what's currently being proposed for the EMFF 2021-2027, which I think is back with the commission now, but I'm not sure exactly where it's at. So although this graph is really um, kind of comforting, we've seen that the EU can make really bold, really good and positive steps you know, it's still not getting to the level that we have to get towards to kind of to to reach what we agreed, what we signed up to as EU member states in the United Nations SDGs, which is to remove or redirect all harmful fishery subsidies. So although it's really uh, positive, we've taken positive steps forward, there's still a long way to go. And um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the EMFF 2021 kind of discussions, uh, mainly because I'm probably not the best person best place person to talk about them. But it's really important that we kind of make sure that we keep pressure to, to keep that positive kind of trend going. Uh, there's been discussions about reintroducing some of the most harmful uh, subsidies, such as uh, loans and, 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 and money for construction, constructing new vessels. Uh, it still includes a lot of um, provisions for replacing engines for, um, and, and, and this is a really kind of, I'm sure there'll be some questions on this, but this is a really kind of um, hotly debated topic about kind of giving money to increase health and safety or increase the efficiency of engines on vessels for reasons of emissions, but while trying to ensure that those vessels don't become more efficient at catching fish, right? And so uh, contributing to that overcapacity that the EU fleet still, still suffers from in many cases. So although we've seen kind of this positive trend, it's taken a long time to get there. And um, there's kind of a number of reasons of why it's taken so long and why even after 20 years of negotiations in the WTO, we're still struggling to get a kind of multilateral agreement to get rid of these uh, subsidies. Um, a paper came out at the end of last year by colleagues that kind of discussed, I think, five or six of these uh, myths about fishery subsidies. So I've kind of picked out three that I think are possibly most relevant to the EU that I'm going to quickly kind of discuss here. Uh, the first one being that capacity enhancing subsidies are necessary to for smaller fishing nations uh, either within the EU or, or put, um, at with small uh, larger nations outside the EU for them to compete on a kind of economic level with these other fisheries. Um, so this is kind of um, self-defeating in a way because if you look back to those graphs where I showed you the amount of subsidies provided by on a regional level you know countries such as China are providing seven billion dollars of fishery subsidies every year which is many times more the kind of GDP of some of these countries so trying to introduce um, subsidies to try and compete on a global scale with these huge kind of the spending power of other countries is uh, self-defeating you end up with them um, is it called the prisoner I can't remember the term but you end up basically with this kind of race to the bottom, right? A race to fish. And actually the best way to try and get parity between these different member states, as far as we're concerned, is to remove harmful fishery subsidies, support the fishing industry to develop in different ways that don't lead to, to um, harm to fish stocks. Um, the second myth is that capacity enhancing subsidies are important for alleviating poverty. So some of these kind of small scale inshore fishing communities, you know, we know that there are difficult times, particularly with kind of what's happening at the moment. And so fishery subsidies are often uh, put forward as a way to alleviate that pressure to help support uh, the kind of most vulnerable societies. Um, 
which sounds great, but as our kind of uh, work has shown is that actually these subsidies aren't being provided to the small scale fleet. They aren't being provided to the most vulnerable people in our uh, communities generally. They're being provided to kind of large scale industrial fleets and being provided by the highest HDI countries. The second point on that for alleviating poverty is a lot of research has shown that these kind of subsidies that when you introduce them into a fishery, they actually can erode the resource base, right? So you actually result in less profitable fisheries, less resources for those fishers to exploit. And so actually, in order to kind of try and create more profitable fisheries, more viable fisheries, as far as we're concerned, the best thing to do is remove those harmful fisheries subsidies and to introduce them into kind of in, through, via better means. Uh, another point on that about alleviating, alleviating poverty is that, as we saw, is the highest, the, the, the largest subsidy type across the world is, is fuel subsidies. And there's been um, studies on this to see how efficient are fuel subsidies. And in fact, for every US dollar spent, there's only about a 10 cent increase in fisher income. So they're highly inefficient ways to try and alleviate poverty if that is the goal of these subsidies. The third kind of myth that I'm gonna bring up here is that overfishing only affects national interests, so international agreements are unnecessary. Uh, this is when I've gone around and talked about these things at kind of WTO meetings and things, this is often brought up is that, you know, if we provide fishery subsidies, it's fine. You know, we can do to our fish stocks what we want. Well, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's everybody's quite aware that these fish stocks don't respect uh, national boundaries. Uh, many of these stocks are transboundary, so what we do in one uh, easy, easy affects what happens in another. Um, again, as our kind of uh, the breakdown of our estimates show, in fact, the majority of these um, fishery subsidies are provided to large scale industrial fishing fleets, and as we know, some of these uh, vessels are now able to fish way beyond the EEZ of, of, of the nation providing the subsidy. You know, some of these fishing fleets will fish way beyond even the region or the continent that, that they're kind of landing or that they're flagged with it. So the support provided by the EU, for example, to some of these fishing fleets isn't necessarily gonna only affect the fish stocks in their waters. It can, you know, the, the, if you're reducing their um, costs, you know, they can quite easily go and fish in different waters. So essentially, you know, the world is really, as we've seen quite clearly with recent events, the world is massively interconnected and particularly the world of fisheries because it's one ocean. And um, what we do um, in terms of the economics of our fishery in one region can have a major impact on the fisheries across the world. Whether that's in terms of our fishing vessels going and fishing in different waters, or whether that's in terms of you know, altering the price of fish in one region because, you know, there's so much trade of seafood that that can have a negative impact across the world on other fisheries. Um, so hopefully I kind of very briefly, with my time left, broke down some of those kind of myths about fishery subsidies. I would recommend going and reading this um, paper. Uh, there'll be a list of references that will be shared at the end for that. Uh, so just really quickly, finally, this is just something I did very quickly last week. This isn't like really based on anything analytical. Um, I just keep thinking like, why can we not get fishery subsidies at the front of the debate? Or why can we not create these changes in terms of what we need to do, what lots of the science shows we do, and what all these um, different member states and nations are signing up to do, but not actually delivering, you know, which is to end harmful fishery subsidies. So what I quickly did is I looked at just... Google searches as a proxy for kind of public interest in fishery subsidies over time. And you can kind of see this uh, quite depressing reduction in uh, people searching fishery subsidies. As I say, this has not been kind of peer reviewed or anything. Um, so this isn't great news and we know what can happen when we kind of get the public on board and interested in uh, sustainability concern, right? Particularly in the EU. Um, when uh, discards became the talk, you know, really hot topic, within a few years or less than that, the EU, you know, jumped into action. All right, we might debate whether the landing obligation was the right action, but, you know, it spurred an action and instantly there was a huge um, policy change in terms of trying to address the sustainability concern. So perhaps this is kind of something for 
uh, us to think about and obviously things like today this webinar hopefully will help lead to this becoming a bigger issue so i just quickly compared as well fishery subsidies to other hot issues like climate change that you can see is kind of at the end slowly increasing and then veganism as well which is like the you know is, is, is really becoming quite a popular topic of discussion in terms of sustainability so i think maybe you know this is something to consider how do we get fishery subsidies as exciting and as uh, talked about as as veganism perhaps i don't think i have an answer to that by the way i just thought i'd, I'd pose that as a question um so this is a list of some of the um published papers that i've kind of referenced today there's a few that hasn't been published yet but will hopefully come out in the next few months um, I think, as, as Anna said, this will be shared after my um, after the talk. So that's it, guys. Hopefully, there's some questions for me to answer. I hope you enjoyed that talk. Uh, just like to thank Pew for funding a lot of this work, and then um, some of the partners, which uh, see around us at UBC and Ocean Canada, for for helping kind of get this work out there. Hey, Daniel. Thank you so much Hi. for this very, very, very clear presentation. I, I think I can speak for everybody when I said this was super interesting and helpful. Very nice to see those last few charts on, on, um, on the interest of people about uh, fishery subsidies. Quite, quite interesting. I wonder how wet markets are, are performing now. <laughs> um, so we have a few questions already. We have nine so okay. far. So we invite oh, you to, uh, to leave your questions, comments, and everything you need uh, here in this Q&A. And we'll start with one from Vera, from Vera Coelho from Oceana. Hi, Vera. How are you? Uh, and Vera is asking, uh, do you have any insights on why the amount of harmful subsidies hasn't been much reduced over the last decade, despite political commitments and efforts in that regard? Um, yeah, so the first thing to kind of just discuss on that, which is obviously the academic kind of response, is that um, the reason I don't often compare directly 2009 and 2018 data of ours is that um, we're always changing our kind of methodology, right? So we're always trying to improve it. We're always trying to look deeper, look at like more nations to try and improve our estimates. So I kind of very loosely said it hasn't gone down since 2009. I uh, just want to like back that up with that the methodology has changed slightly which could have had an impact but uh, fundamentally yeah we don't think that it's gone down at all and i would say um so the efforts really through the wto the negotiations although the wto have been negotiating this for 20 years it's only really stepped up since the kind of un uh, sdgs sustainable development goals kind of were introduced which was uh, 2015 i think um, so that kind of reinvigorated the discussion, right? So before that, there was ongoing discussions, but there wasn't really ever like a deadline or a uh, defined kind of target of what we need to achieve. So the SDGs introduction in 2015 was really useful in terms of that. It kind of got everybody together. It really gave quite an impetus to try and like uh, work towards this actual goal, which it, which it outlines quite clearly. So I think that's a big reason is that really like there's, there's not been very well, um, there's, n there's not been a focus to it until the last five years. Um, I would say there's also a lot of other issues in terms of the kind of finer details of the negotiations. Firstly, um, a lot of different entities, whether that's political or academic, still debate what a harmful fishery subsidy is. Um, you know when does it cause harm a lot of um people in or, or groups in these discussions are kind of they don't want to determine a single subsidy as harmful as always being harmful because you can find examples where it's been introduced and the fish stock doesn't uh, reduce because of you know huge efforts put in to manage that stock whether that's by quotas or whatever so there's a real um kind of difficulty in defining fishery subsidies and um, that's still an ongoing debate, despite the fact that we're supposed to get rid of them this year. We're still debating what they are. Um, there's also kind of, I think personally, particularly in the WTO negotiations, there's kind of these, there's levels of discussion of what we're going to remove. And so if you remember the SDG targets to remove subsidies that contribute to overcapacity, overfishing and IEU fishing. And so what, 
I'm aware of, which I think is a bit dangerous, is that they kind of are working their way up from the easiest thing to do, right? So the first thing at the moment, which we should be able to get through quite easily, is that they're going to remove government support to vessels engaging in illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing, which seems quite obvious, right? So that's kind of one aspect of that target. Uh, removing that, though, is going gonna, is gonna to remove about, I think, less than 1% of the world's fishery subsidies. And then the next level up is kind of that um, subsidies that contribute to overfishing. So there's also discussion about trying to remove subsidies that are provided to fishing that's, uh, that's being conducted on overfished stocks, which, again, sounds quite obvious. Why would you financially support fishing on stocks that are depleted and kind of prop them up? which again sounds great, sounds easy to do, but actually really difficult in practice to work out where these subsidies go. And then the third one is the one that we're kind of interested in, which is removing all subsidies that um, contribute to overcapacity. And again, there's, there's, there's so much kind of nuance and debate about what that means, how do you do it in practice? So kind of to summarize, I would say, um, the problem is, is that there's still, there's still a lot of debate about what the actual aim of it is, rather than even how to do it yet. And until I think we get a really firm agreement on what harmful subsidies are, how, then we can work out how we're going to remove them. I hope, I hope that helps answer. Yeah, yeah, qu quite a complete answer. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, so again, thank you very much for the presentation. Very clear and a nice, nice sequence of, of topics. And looking a little bit at the beginning of the presentation where you gave a global perspective, which is very good because obviously we're focusing on the EMFF, but it's nice to have a global perspective on these subsidies. And we have a question regarding that. So uh, John Pierce, thank you for the question. Uh, he asks, um, so on the breakdown of updated fishery subsidies, do you have these by FAO area? rather than just by continent and right. um, where they're applied and not just the flag states, um, but yeah, the, the FEO area. Yeah, um, no, a uh, short answer. Um, so our database, the way we kind of approach this is that we look at the, we investigate the governments providing these grants, right? So we look at the kind of fishing entity we don't really look uh, into a lot of detail. There's a few spin-off papers that have looked at where these subsidies actually um, go. Um, but for me, that's, it's, it's difficult, right? Because we look at the, at the government as a whole and the subsidies they provide, and we don't often look at how that's then distributed. Because some of these um, subsidies may be at the fish stock level, so fisheries management, things like that. Other subsidies might be at the fleet level, like fuel subsidies. But actually finding information about which vessel actually kind of uh, benefit or, or the degree to which each vessel or each fleet benefits from these subsidies is, is, is a lot of work. Like, I think it'd be really good to try and do that at the level of an individual entity, maybe at the level of the EU. It might be possible because they've got a lot more data. But certainly at our global level, the database that we build, we don't break that down. Um, there is some efforts to do that, though. Um, uh, the guys at uh, Santa Barbara, I think, I've forgotten the name of the group that are doing it now. Uh, but there's a website that I can, maybe I'll add it to the end, an, an extra slide on my, on my presentation to be shared. There's like this interactive website where they've been trying to do this exact thing, which is they're using our data of subsidies um, provision, and then they're mapping that on uh, to the fleets that might receive this, and then where those fleets operate across the world to look at like, if we got rid of this subsidy, which ecosystems would benefit? Um, so our data has gone into that, but it's not kind of work that we've, we've done. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry. I can't remember the name of the website at all, but it's a really cool interactive map where you can like play around with all this and see where these subsidies might, um, might be impacting. And I'll add that to the PowerPoint, but our research doesn't actually, doesn't actually do that, I'm afraid. Just, just due to the difficulties in, in doing it at the moment. I haven't had time, John. If you could then send us also that link, that would be very yeah. helpful. Um, and then we have another question, uh, which is from Beatrice. And she's asking if, uh, since f fishing quotas limit the amount of fish you can catch, and since you, since you can buy more qu quotas, won't these subsidies help increase catch and lead to overfishing? I think this one is easy, no? <laughs> Sorry, could you, uh, could, I, could you say that again? I missed the first bit, sorry. Uh, I think you can also read them. 
if you yeah. if you go to your Q and A um, icon. Oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I see this. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Since fishing quotas limit the amount of fish you can catch, and since you buy more quotas, um, yeah. So that that's yeah. It sounds simple. That's that's a bit more complicated in practice because um, the idea of quotas, yes, um, they can be transferred, right? And different uh, entities can can kind of collect larger amounts of quotas to increase their fishing. But fundamentally, quotas should mean that um, the overall catch taken from the stock is, is the same, right? So um, there might be an issue in terms of concentration and kind of monopolization of the fisheries, but the idea of quotas, and this is a big argument used by developed uh, countries often, why they can give harmful subsidies is that we have really strict quotas, right? There's no way we can overfish our stocks, regardless of whether we give capacity enhancing subsidies, because the catch is capped at a sustainable level. And that sounds like a really good argument, but our kind of um, uh, retort to that is that, well, particularly in the EU, right, as an example, we've just heard, I think it was this week, that you know they put into law that they had to end overfishing. That's not happened, right? There's still overfish stocks in the EU, particularly in the Mediterranean. There's still overfishing occurring. You know, advice about the level of uh, TAC that's set is often seen as as a kind of target that you can go either side of rather than a limit. So we still see, despite all this investment and efforts to uh, to limit the amount of fish taken from the stock, we still see overfishing. So yeah, our argument is that you know is that that that's a flawed position to say that having strict quotas means that we can give harmful fishery subsidies because it's kind of going to prevent overfishing until you have all your stocks at MSY, right? And all your fishing, all your stocks are not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. Then I think that becomes a, a good argument or discussion to have, but I don't know whether that directly answered your question, but um, yeah, quotas comes up as a kind of, um, reason to be able to continue with fishery subsidies, particularly because our argument is that they increase capacity, right? They incentivize capacity. And, and the idea of a quota is that it prevents, it has a ceiling of capacity, right? You can't go above it or you shouldn't go above it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, next question comes from uh, Lauren from BirdLife. Thank you, Lauren. So uh, first of all, she thanks you for a very clear presentation. Uh, and she asks, so where can we access the catalog subsidies that you mentioned are now available online? Uh, yeah, so there are two papers on this. There's a paper that kind of in uh, marine policy, and I, I say it will be in that uh, reference link um, that shows our uh, re most recent estimates and provides all those kind of graphs um, and a, a big discussion about what it means. And then there's also, uh, for the first time this year, or last year rather, we published all the data and all the model script all the raw data, we published everything for whoever wants to kind of do it. I wouldn't suggest you do unless you, you've got a lot of time. You can rebuild the data set. So that is in a, um, it's a journal called Data in Brief. And again, that'll be, I'll, I'll make sure that's on the reference list, but that has all the information on there. Um, also, uh, this year soon, we will be putting it on the See Around Us website. Um, if you guys may not be as aware of this, uh, but our colleagues at UBC have this really great website called See Around Us, S-E-A. And um, that kind of has this really cool interactive uh, system where you can uh, click on a country's EEZ or you can cl click on a large marine ecosystem like the Mediterranean and it will give you all the information that UBC have collated for that region. So whether that's Fish, fish landing, uh, fish prices, or subsidies. Uh, so I'd, I'd suggest also going there if you want to look at a specific kind of region, because it's a much easier tool to use than going through our big data set. So hopefully that, that answered your question, Lauren. Yes, I'm sorry, I was muted, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we have another question, thank you for answering Lauren. Um, and the next question is, which is from an, an anonymous participant, is how do the impacts of beneficial and harmful subsidies given in one year vary in their persistence in subsequent years? How do they uh, persist? Uh, okay, 
Um, so just firstly, so what I'll do is I'll talk about between our, um, our estimates, because we don't conduct this analysis every year. Um, in fact, what we actually do, because data is so patchy, what we normally do is we kind of have a, um, we might have a window. So let's say a five year window that we look for data in that five year, right, period because data is so patchy. These, um, these kind of data aren't released every year by governments across the world. Um, uh, for some governments like the EU, where it's released every year, great, we'll use the most recent data. But what we do is we normally look over a five year window. Um, and so some of our data points might be from 2014, for example, and then we kind of you know, standardize it so it's relevant for 2018. So we don't do uh, year on year, um, uh, analyses of this we are doing a project right now actually for the World Bank that is trying to do that is trying to create a time series and um, so we kind of have these really discrete like um, intervals at when we provide an estimate and as I said before because we're not using the same method every time we shy away from direct comparison between them um, so I know I kind of skirted around the question there but I think another, so just to talk about beneficial and capacity enhancing subsidies, right? Another big discussion, area of discussion is that, and, and we acknowledge that beneficial subsidies can uh, mitigate effects of harmful subsidies, right? Like we just talked about um, quotas. If you have a really well-managed fishery and you really do enforce that quota, quota cap, which is within sustainable levels, you know, you can mitigate impacts of harmful subsidies. The difficulty comes is that, um, there's often not the data to look at it at the level of a fish stock or at the level of a fishing fleet. So a lot of our data is at um, the global level, regional, and in some cases, um, individual country level. So even at that kind of granularity, which see, it seems great, just because you might have 50% beneficial, 50% harmful subsidies, doesn't mean they kind of directly cancel each other out, right? Um, Harmful subsidies might be provided to different fishing fleets than beneficial. And um, secondly, we don't know that kind of, you know, $1, $1 of good subsidies, you know, gets rid of $1 of harmful subsidies. Yeah, the, the impact of a dollar uh, or a million dollars of, of, of fuel subsidies might be much greater than investing a million dollars in fisheries management, for example. You know, we just don't know that kind of information to be able to do those direct comparisons. And, and when we do do kind of case studies on that, that's really great. It can help inform our debate, but then extrapolating that to our global data set of, you know, the global estimate of beneficial and harmful subsidies is, is um, I wouldn't suggest doing that really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so another question from uh, Lauren is, uh, what's the source of the graph on subsidies? The one that mentions uh, fuel, fuel subsidies. Uh, that's the same, same source. So if you get that, those two sources that I said about um, our global estimates for 2018 and our database. So our database has um, 13 subsidy types across those three beneficial ambiguous capacity enhancing subsidies. 13 subsidy types, which includes like fuel subsidies, boat construction, um, for, I can't remember what it is now, 150 countries. So that, that all comes from the same, the same data source. So uh, as I say, I, I normally try and present like quite high level uh, data from it because sometimes if you start really looking into the finer detail of, you know, of, of an individual country and individual type of subsidy, because of the nature of how we create this database, you know, it's, it's, it's an estimate, right? It's, it's not always using um, raw data. In some cases it's modeled. And so I just think like it's much more accurate to look at it kind of collectively than to try and dig into it. But that data is all available in that data in brief um, article. All right, um, we have two more questions in our, in our box and we are going to answer them. We are going to extend this for five more minutes since we started five minutes uh, uh, late also. And we have one question from Vera, uh, which, which is, um, why have capacity enhancing subsidies increased between 2014 and 2018? It seems like quite a reversal of a positive overall trend. I think she's referring to one of your uh, graphics. Yeah, um, I think that might be the... Uh... I assume that's the global trend because the EU, it's, it's about the same. Oh, 
yeah, it's about the same. Uh, no, sorry, capacity enhanced and subsidies have reduced in the EU. Oh, wait, no, I'm looking at that data now. Okay, sorry, let me start again. So she, is it she? She is referring to, yeah, the, the graph of EU subsidies. Um, shall I share my screen to, so that you can see it again? Yeah, you can, yeah. So yeah, it's increased here. Um, so importantly, which I probably didn't point out strongly enough, this graph can only really give us an indication of, of, of subsidy trends. It's not, it's not like, like a lot of these kind of global works or these, these work where you're looking at like quite difficult data to kind of get your hands on. This, this has to be, you have to take the, like understand the uh, limitations of this. So this takes on board several data sources it takes on board our um, 2018 study, the one I've been talking about, our 2009 study, and our 2003 study. So these three sources of data here are all from our um, UBC's estimations. 1994, 2000, 2007, and 2014 are taken from EU's um, publications. So that's on what member states, um, what they uh, states they've spent their, um, their 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 money on, and then and then what? So so the the way the way these fish these funds work is like every year the states have to report what they're spending and what they intend to spend, and at the end of the year there's normally a huge evaluation on what's been spent. So this 2014 study, uh, sorry, data, is on the is the ongoing EMFF, right? And so because it's ongoing, we don't know exactly how that money's been spent. It's still being spent now. So these kind of balance, this balance of the three subsidy types in, on each bar is, uh, is, is the kind of best data we have for that year. So it has to be kind of, this is why I kind of just look at the general trend rather than uh, year to year comparisons. So I hope that helps explain. Um, I suspect it's more to do with the source of data than it is to do with potentially a real uh, uh, increase in capacity enhancing subsidies possibly. Uh, when this paper comes out, it will discuss all those kind of um, the caveats of, of, of this table. It's not as easy when you're just when you're presenting it um, to get bogged down in those. Yeah. Hopefully that helps. Any other, any idea of when it's going to be published? Sorry. By the uh, way, <laughs> uh, it's just um, it's on the second round of re review. So okay. Uh, ask, yeah, the, ask the, the reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, the last question actually also also yeah, relates to that yeah. graph, but I think you've explained it a little bit. It, it was like that difference between 2014 and 2018 uh, and the difference between the values of capacity enhancing subsidies, but I think you explained it in your last question, yeah. in your last yeah. answer, I mean. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. I, I, I would like to... <laughs> To ask a question, if I may, we still yep. have two minutes. Um, uh, actually, this this amb ambiguous subsidy is caught my eye, and uh, I wanted to know if you could give us an example because, from from my understanding, uh, these these subsidies can be whether bad or good uh, depending on how they are implemented. Um, could you could you give us an example of of, uh, of a, an example of a subsidy of an ambiguous subsidy that? Um, yeah, for sure. So. Um, and again, that, that paper that I referenced has a kind of uh, definition, uh, an, an annex that has a definition of all our kind of subsidy types. So this graph here, quickly, I'll show you. So the A is ambiguous. So it's things like rural fisher uh, development. So money spent on um, rural communities. Uh, you can understand if you, that sounds like a great thing and obviously can be a really great thing, but it depends in how that's um, exactly spent in terms of what impact that might have on the fishing fleet. Uh, other things like fisher assistance. Uh, there was an example of, uh, I remember discussing a, a case in India where um, there, was, uh, there was like some kind of pollution effect or something in a river and, and, and they had to give all these fishers along this, riv this river money to keep them going between like their ability to fish. And again, that is obviously potentially a very good use of funds. But if you do that just because the fish stock has been overfished, for example, that fisher assistance because, you know, then you're kind of artificially um, propping up the fishing community, uh, the fishing fleet, you know, during times when uh, ecologically that wouldn't normally sustain that fishing fleet. I don't know if I explained that very well. So 
so all the ones with A here are, are ambiguous. Uh, it includes vessel buyback, which uh, I think, yeah, has now been um, eliminated from EU expenditure. But again, it's the same principle there. It's like vessel buyback can be really great and it can remove capacity from the fishing fleet. But when the EU first introduced it, for example, there was no um, stipulation that the people receiving this or the, or the enterprises receiving that uh, money for their, to get their vessel out couldn't go and buy a new vessel. So what happened in some cases was we took old vessels out of the fishing fleet and were re replaced by a new vessel. You know, I, I think they quickly um, cottoned on to that and, and, and stopped it. But, so that's a kind of example where there's too many cases of it being good and bad that we just kind of lump them together in this gray area. Yeah, yeah. Nice, thank you very much. I think we ended just right on time, if my clock yep. is right. Um, so I would like to thank you once more. I'm very happy that we got to answer all the questions. That's really cool. Uh, thank you, Daniel, once again for, for being available so, so, so fast. Actually, we just talked last week. So thank you very, very much. I think this was very enlightening. And this was recorded as well. Uh, and we are going to send a record to, to everybody that was here in the presentation. I don't know if you want to say anything else. Um, if not, no, thank you very much for um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It's nice to uh, you know with what's going on at the moment. It's just nice to talk to some other people, isn't it? <laughs> yes, people, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Nick. Right, thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Daniel. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.